armies of the United Nations have made their first landings on the soil of Western Europe. Another of the great decisive battles of world history has been joined. This is the day for which free people long have waited. This is D-Day. Early June 1944. The Allied invasion of Normandy is barely a week old, and Allied forces fight to establish their beachhead in France. The war is entering its final phase. For the civilian population of Great Britain, the uncertainty of the early war years has eased. The fear of German invasion and the blitz on the capital are a thing of the past. Surely the war on the home front was all but over. But the Nazi war machine has one last trick up its sleeve. In the early morning of the 13th of June 1944, a strange aircraft is seen in the morning sky over London, and then its engine cuts out. At 4.25am, the first V1 flying bomb hits Grove Road, London. The explosion destroys the railway line into Stratford, damages houses in the surrounding streets, and kills six people. The attack was the first of an estimated 10,000 V1 rockets to be launched to England from June 1944 to March 1945. This was the first of the revenge weapons to be launched at Britain by Hitler's Germany, and proved that even though the German war machine was on the back foot, they would not go down without a fight. Of steel construction, the flying bomb is driven by jet propulsion. Into the power unit, fuel is injected under pressure from compressed air bottles. The bomb is kept on a set course by an automatic pilot. Immediately behind the streamlined nose is a one-ton explosive charge. But how to defend the capital from the doodlebug menace? A Ministry of Information Home Intelligence report from the 22nd of June 1944 reported the public's initial reaction to the V1 attacks and their thoughts on what should be done to stop them. Most Londoners confess to feeling considerably shaken, despite their calm behaviour. Only at the scene of some incidents has there been anything approaching panic. Coupled with nervous anxiety arising in part from the weird and uncanny nature of the new device, and in part from the strain of listening for and to their approach. Aerial reprisals had been expected, but nothing quite like this. The stopping of the AA guns was generally welcomed for two reasons. A. They were disturbing in themselves, appeared to do little good, while effectively preventing sleep. B. The cessation of firing was taken as a sign that fighters were after the flying bombs, and this was regarded as a better way of tackling them. For the British public, the Royal Air Force was to be the remedy for a good night's sleep on the home front. Roland B. Beaumont was one of the RAF's most celebrated pilots by the time the V-1 started attacking London. By June 1944, he was a wing commander of the 1st Tempest Wing at RAF Newchurch. Coming into service in January 1944, the Tempest was one of the RAF's best low-altitude fighter planes of the war. Its Napier Sabre engine allowed the aircraft to reach speeds of up to 430 miles per hour and was armed with four 20mm cannons. Seen this way, the shape of her nose and the heavy radiator are obvious. But it's the whole aircraft you've got to look at. That wing is quite different now. There's a curve to the trailing edge. And the tips are blunted. Look at the fin. See that unusual fairing on its leading edge. Once you know this aircraft, you can never mistake her for anything but a tempest. It was more than a match against the V1s that could only reach speeds of up to 400 miles per hour and were unarmed. Beaumont describes the intricacies of dealing with approaching V1s in a 1988 interview. We found that they were flying at about 380 miles an hour on the average, some of them up to about 390, and that the Tempest's uh, margin of performance at that altitude was just sufficient to enable us to overtake it from astern. And generally speaking, from first sighting, you pulled round a tight turn after it, and we learnt to add uh, 500 to 1,000 feet to the plotted height of any of these things as they came in, so that we would always have height 
margin in our dive onto the uh, target, which would increase our speed. And the majority of the attacks ended up as direct stern attacks. Then the next thing was how close you could get, because you were firing at a bomb containing 1,800 pounds of ammotol. If you ignited that, the chances were that you would probably blow you up. But we found that at, um, firing at 400 yards, it, it was very difficult to hit the target because it was so small. And closing into 200 yards, when, it, when you exploded the bomb, as you often did, then it would damage, damage your fighter. Uh, and so we settled eventually as a compromise, and we tried to uh, uh, open fire no, f no closer in than 300 yards and no further out than 300 yards. And th by that means, we, we got very high scoring rates. Some pilots would attempt an action known as tipping. I saw this thing down on, on my right-hand side, just, just over, over there. And I thought, right now, think. So I r roll over to the right uh, in a descending turn, then roll back, pull left, and come back under it. And we were still in and out of patchy cloud, and I did that. I rolled over. Then ro when I rolled back to the left and looked back, I couldn't see it. There was no sign of it anywhere. And I yeah, looked ahead, and I was, wasn't in cloud then. And it had gone. And then all of a sudden, there was an almighty flash. And I looked back just below, and there was the unmistakable mushroom of, uh, of, the, of this exploding bomb, and it had hit the ground just north of um, Hastings in the woods below me. And I thought, well, now why did it do that? And then I realized that uh, I must have flown across it, and uh, the, the turbulent wake of, of my tempest had toppled the gyro of the V1. Ace pilot Joseph Berry destroyed a record 60 V1s, more than any pilot during the war, including seven in one night on the 23rd of July, 1944. For this, he was awarded a bar to his distinguished flying cross in September 1944. His citation reads, Flight Lieutenant Berry is a highly skilled and resolute pilot. He has completed a very large number of sorties throughout his keenness and devotion to duty have been exceptional. This officer has, within a short period, destroyed numerous flying bombs. Unfortunately, he was killed when his Tempest was shot down over Veendam, Holland, on the 2nd of October 1944. We should also not forget the operations carried out by the RAF and the American bomber crews against the V-1 and V-2 threat. They had been launching raids on German launch sites since 1943 and often received minimal credit for their efforts. This then was our defence system. But Bomber Command was not satisfied and they continued to play their vital role. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Harris allocated hundreds of his heavies to continue the battering of the launching sites, bomb dumps and storage depots. All this without for one moment or by one single aircraft reducing our air offensive against the Nazi war potential. The effectiveness of the Buzz bomb campaign is a hard thing to determine. The true capabilities of the weapon would be greatly expanded and exploited upon in the Cold War, as ex-German scientists who had worked on the weapons would be enlisted into both American and Soviet research programs as the Cold War set in in the 1950s. In my opinion, it is just another drain on Nazi resources, coming too late in the war to have any meaningful effect on the outcome of the conflict. But their legacy is still felt today, with modern missiles and rockets owing their existence to the vengeance weapons of the Second World War. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and subscribe.